और गाइस बिफोर वी मूव ऑन इफ यू वांट टू प्रैक्टिस दिस क्वेश्चंस यूजिंग आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस एंड सी व्हाट मिस्टेक्स यू आर मेकिंग व्हाट स्कोर यू आर लाइक टू डू गेट इन द टेस्ट आई हैव गॉट अ ग्रेट न्यूज़ फॉर यू यू कैन प्रैक्टिस ऑल दिस क्वेश्चंस विद एआई ऑन आवर ऐप LAPT एग्जाम प्रैक्टिस ऐप व्हिच इज अवेलेबल ऑन iOS एंड Android एज वेल प्लस इफ यू वांट टू टेक अ फुल स्कोर्ड मॉक टेस्ट वन फ्री फुल स्कोर मॉक टेस्ट इज अवेलेबल इन द ऐप और यू कैन रजिस्टर ऑन लैंग्वेज अकेडमी डॉट कॉम डॉट ए यू द स्कोर कार्ड यू विल गेट विद द मॉक टेस्ट विल बी एज सिमिलर एज वट यू विल गेट इन द एक्चुअल टेस्ट एंड विच विल मेक इट वेरी क्लियर वट स्कोर यू आर लाइक यू टू गेट आई हाईली रिकमेंड ईच एंड एवरी वन ऑफ यू टू टेक दैट मॉक टेस्ट see what mistakes you are making how to improve and what are the things you need to work on lastly we have got our branches in australia and in india and we do provide online classes if you need any help do contact us on the numbers below now you can continue with the video This is talk about visualizing life without fossil fuels. We have an addiction to fossil fuels and it's not sustainable when I say we. I'm talking about the so called developed world. The developed world gets 80 or 90% of all its energy from fossil fuels and living on fossil fuels for energy in this place. It's not sustainable for three fairly obvious reasons. First, on the left easily, accessible fossil fuels are a finite resource and so some point that resource will be exploited and humanity will have to do something else. Second, setting fire to fossil fuels puts carbon dioxide upstairs. So, we have the climate motivation. The clear consensus of the climate science community is with substantial arrow bars still on exactly what might happen. Their advice is this is a geoengineering experiment that was well advised to stop as soon as possible. And third, even if you don't believe in climate change and even if global fossil fuels aren't running out today, it might be the case that your fossil fuels or our fossil fuels in a particular country or state have run out and you might depend on other countries or states for fossil fuels in the future. So, you have a security of supply motivation for saying let's look into really getting off fossil fuels in a serious way. I find all three of these motivations are equally compelling and I'm just going to take it as given now that we are interested in discussing life after fossil fuels. So everyone gets rather emotional when we get to into this topic of what to do at our energy system. And when I wrote my book about sustainable energy, I was trying to help. I'm sure emotions are important, but we also need facts and numbers. I tried to write a book that would be agreed by everyone as having a useful number.
In 1906 in New York City, the Warren family got sick with the disease called typhoid fever. Typhoid fever was a scary disease without a cure. First a person would feel tired and feverish, and then they would have muscle aches, weight loss, rash and a swollen abdomen. Quite often typhoid fever would lead to death. A government worker came to the Warren home to investigate and see where the typhoid fever could have come from. As the worker investigated, he took notice of the cook Mary Mallon. Mallon had worked as a cook for many families in the early 1900s and each of them had contracted typhoid fever. It was soon realized that Mary Mallon was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. That meant that she had the disease all the time but she never felt any symptoms of it. She was spreading the disease without even knowing it. Mallon was given the nickname Typhoid Mary. Doctors and scientists were very intrigued by Mallon and wanted to examine her, but she would always refuse. There was even an instance that she chased away doctors with a carving fork. Eventually, she was arrested and sent to a prison. Doctors were finally able to determine that her gallbladder was where the dangerous bacteria was and they offered to remove it, but she refused. Mallon was sent to live in a quarantine hospital on North Brother Island in New York. She lived there for three years before she was released. At that point, she had to agree to change occupations and not be a cook anymore. Mallon did that for a time but later changed her name to Mary Brown and began working as a cook again. Of course, families became sick and typhoid Mary was to blame. Mallon kept running from authorities as she went from job to job and people became sick. She was finally stopped after she started an outbreak at the Sloan Hospital for Women in New York City. Mallon was quarantined for the remainder of her life.
I'd like to start this lecture on the use of technology in education by talking about a subject that's probably close to all your hearts, which is the way that student work is graded. And specifically I want to talk to you about some of the ways written assignments or essays are marked. Well, as you all know, traditionally writing done by a student is checked, marked and graded by a teacher, a tutor or in some situations an examiner, in other words, a real person. Software to mark essays has been in development for some time and grading software on computers is already used by some universities to mark exams but it is still viewed with suspicion by some. How can a computer mark an essay they ask? Well, a recent study compared the human ability to give grades to student essays to the ability of a computer to do the same job. In the study, over 16,000 essays were used. These essays had already been previously marked by at least one trained human grader. The study showed that the essay marks given by the computer software were almost the same as those from human graders, which I think you'll agree is a controversial result and it's likely to make us as teachers re-evaluate how we grade written work. For anthropologists and archaeologists, rock art is a kind of window into our ancestors' evolution, migration and lifestyle. These insights that we get from rock art are highly valued by archaeologists because they complement the often scant information provided by excavated objects. It turns out that there are common themes in rock art between sites in Europe and caves where they have discovered rock art in China. In fact, some recurring motifs in rock art have been observed all over the world. It is truly remarkable that the hunter-gatherers of the Yunnan province in China left very similar creations to the Magdalenians, who lived nearly 9,000 kilometers away in Western Europe and thousands of years prior. Both feature outline images of human predators and prey, from bears and lions to stags, horses and bulls. Now, both regions were inhabited by hunter-gatherers, on similar terrain. But there's more to it than that. One thing that we think it might reflect, this similarity of rock art in these distant places, is that human beings are essentially the same in their thinking. So, whether it's the ancient people of Europe, or in Asia, they did things and drew things in very similar ways.
One of the questions I guessed a lot is how do we get good local government, good bureaucracy, and how do we see these positive changes come forward? And it's interesting because a lot of the time we pay attention to the pioneers, the people coming with new ideas or sometimes we pay attention to the big bosses, the politicians, or the big civil servants, but it seems to me the really important people in seeing kind of widespread change are people like Morak. Morak is a manager for a council called North Funnish Council, it's in Scotland. And what Morak has done for many years now is constantly work away with her colleagues to figure out how do we keep making the system better. We make our countertops with quartz, our clothes with cotton, our windows with glass, and our streets with asphalt, because water can't dissolve these materials. They're made mostly of molecules, with no charged parts. It would be silly to build, say, windows with something that can dissolve in water, like sugar, unless you're going to eat them. And lots of the substances that water does dissolve, like washable markers, are things we engineered so that they can be washed away. We've also engineered versions that aren't dissolvable in water for when we don't want them to be washed away, by making sure water dissolves what we want it to and only what we want it to. We've been able to adapt a life to a world in which water dissolves so much stuff.
In 2012, after reviewing the evidence, the American Medical Association released a major statement, Night light can disrupt your sleep cycle. However, for whatever reason, not many people have been since informed about it. So here is the basics of what you need to know. When you're exposed to a significant amount of light, specifically of the blue wavelengths, your body suppresses melatonin production to make you feel more awake. Normally this evolutionary design works pretty well. With the coming of night and day, our melatonin levels waxes and wanes, giving us a circadian rhythm. However, since the invention of artificial lights, we're being exposed to more and more light at night time and these effects can be pretty big. Long-term exposure to noise can lead to loss of hearing. The relative loudness of sounds is measured in decibels. Just to give you an idea of what this means. The sound of a whisper is 30 decibels, while a normal conversation is 60 decibels. The noise a vacuum cleaner makes is around 85 decibels. The danger zone, the risk of injury begins at around 90. Continual exposure to sounds above 90 decibels can damage your hearing loud noises, especially when they come at you every day. All this noise can damage the delicate hair cells in your inner ear. Lots of everyday noises are bad for us in the long run. For example, a car horn sounds at around 100 decibels. A rock band at close range is 125 decibels. A jet engine at close range is one of the worst culprits at an ear-busting 140 decibels. The first thing to go is your high-frequency hearing, where you detect the consonant sounds and words. That's why a person with hearing loss can hear voices, but has trouble understanding what's being said.
Dr. Tony Wagner believes there are seven skills that young people need to have in order for them to find and keep a good job in today's economy. But he thinks our schools are focusing too much on tests on academic performance and aren't doing enough to teach those skills. Let me give you an example. One of organ as an and skills is the ability to work in an international team. This is because little teamwork is carried out in one building anymore. When most global companies have a problem, they create teams of people from all over the world to solve it. And these people meet online in virtual meeting rooms. To succeed in this kind of environment, you need to be a good communicator and understand different cultures. Teams also need good leaders who lead by influencing others. But Wagner and the business people he interviewed say that young people today are unprepared for teamwork and leadership. Because of this, Wagner thinks that people involved in teaching and learning must rethink the way that they educate people in schools. So that these young people have the skills they need to achieve a successful career in the 21st century. How would you define, reasonable, as it is used in law? For example, you are allowed to use, reasonable force, when defending yourself. It seems to depend on how serious the situation was, whether it was possible to resolve it by peaceful means, whether you are ready to try those means and, finally, the relative strengths of those involved. Now, most men know, and they've probably grasped this from their earliest years in the school playground, that, when it comes to blows, fights don't stop until one of you is in no shape to do any damage to the other. The criteria mentioned seem a bit fuzzy to me. How can you convince a jury you were ready to try and talk your way out of it when the other person would have none of it and, besides, he was quick to land the first punch? Also you can strike the first blow and still plead self-defense. Of course, you again have the problem of convincing people that the threat was so great that you had no alternative, 
apart from getting beaten up yourself. Reacting calmly and rationally to a perceived threat is not easy to do. The basic English person's diet in medieval times was made up of bread, cheese and beef, while ale was the drink for all ages. And social classes except for the aristocracy, who drank wine. In winter there were no root crops to feed the animals, so they were killed in autumn and the meat salted to preserve it. People kept livestock even in the towns. Cows were usually kept tied or tethered, but pigs were allowed to wander at will, feeding on the rubbish off the streets. By the 16th century, however, choice in foodstuffs had grown, including exotic spices to add flavor to the usual diet. This had come about because European rulers wanting to increase their power and wealth and also, in fairness, in the spirit of enquiry and the quest for knowledge, had financed voyages of exploration overseas. This opened up trade routes, bringing precious spices, and vast profits, from the east, and to the West Spanish and Portuguese explorers had brought back such novelties as potatoes, tomatoes, maize, peppers and chocolate. It must be said, though, that it took people some time to accept some of these new foods, as they feared they were poisonous. So, just a few weeks ago excavators of a remote archaeological site in Southeast M. Asia reported an exciting find under the ground, they found evidence of a writing system which dates back thousands of years. Three blocks of flat rock with odd symbols which look like ancient forms of writing were discovered. Well, 
This find could reveal much about an advanced, independent urban culture which historians believe may have lived in that area. However, many scholars are skeptical about the authenticity of the blocks, which they suspect. In 19th century Britain, and indeed in the first half of the 20th century, many of the urban poor lived in extremely cramped conditions. Overcrowding, damp, and poor sanitation affected the daily lives of the majority of the population, with serious implications for their own and their children's health. Novelists have a major role to play in reflecting their times to their readers who may otherwise ignore social problems, and the portrayal of the wretched living conditions of the impoverished by such writers as Charles Dickens in the 19th century and George Orwell in the 20th was instrumental in. Although the original American Indian cultures were highly diverse, they were similar in many of their traditions. Religious beliefs and rituals permeated every aspect of Indian life. Southwest tribes such as the Hopi and the Apaches had a rich and elaborate year-round sequence of ceremonials, including songs, dances, and poetry. The Hopi performed dances to bring rain. The Apaches engaged in special dances and ceremonies to gain support of the spirits before undertaking raids or going into war. The Plains tribes often sought contact with the spirits by going on a vision quest.
leisure travel was, in a sense, a British invention. This was mainly due to economic and social factors, Britain was the first country to become fully industrialized, and industrial society offered growing numbers of people time for leisure. This, coupled with improvements in transport, especially the railways, meant that large numbers of people could get to holiday resorts in a very short time. Modern mass tourism of a sort we can easily recognize today began in 1841 when Thomas Cook organized the first package tour, in which everything was included in the cost, travel, hotel, and entertainment. To gain access to the facilities, student cards must be shown. To gain access to the facilities, student cards must be shown. Food that contains antibiotics provides little or no nutritional value. Food that contains antibiotics provides little or no nutritional value. The development has a great negative impact on the environment.
the development has a great negative impact on the environment. Weather forecasts will have a big change in the next century. Weather forecasts will have a big change in the next century. I have scored 73 in my PD in only 10 days. I will achieve my desired score just in 20 days. My desired score. Desired score. My desired score. Desired PD score. Desired score. Desired score. Desired score. Desired score. My desired score. My desired score. Language Academy to achieve.